Each week, American History TV sits in on a lecture with one of the nation's college professors. You can watch the classes here every Saturday at 8 p.m. and midnight Eastern and Sundays at 1 p.m. Eastern. This week, an examination of urban America in the mid-20th century with Brian Purnell, a professor at Bowdoin College in Maine. The class is part of a course called The Wire, Race, Class, Gender, and the Urban Crisis, which covers the social, economic, political, and cultural dynamics of U.S. cities after World War II. This lasts an hour, 20 minutes. So today is a lecture on the origins of the urban crisis, right? The term urban crisis is in the title of this class, right? Race, class, gender, and the urban crisis. We use the HBO miniseries, The Wire, as a text, right? Uh, to study or to think about the urban crisis. Um, and also, again, we use The Wire for the sociological presentation it gives us Right, of post-war American cities, and also to ask questions of it, right? because it gives us this window into the post-war city through the police procedural, right? through fighting crime or through police and criminals, right? which allows us to see a great many things, right? but it also uh, occludes and hides other elements of life in post-war cities as well. Right, so we use the wire both, both for what it does and what it doesn't do. Right, but today's lecture is more or less a historical overview of the origins of the urban crisis. And that comes from the title of a book, of a monograph, uh, 1995 um, uh, book by Thomas Segrew. You read an excerpt from it. Segrew's book was called The Origins of the Urban Crisis, and he concentrated on Detroit. And... Um, that's where I'm, I'm using the title of, of the lecture. You know, what will this lecture do? Uh, it does about five things. One, it will give an overview of the concept of the post-war urban crisis, right? So what does that term mean? Two, uh, we will do some historical contrasts, right, between what Arnold Hirsch referred to as the black enclaves or black communities, or maybe you could call it the, the first ghetto, right? And what he labels as the second ghetto, right? We'll do some contrast between those two historical moments in American urban history. Three, we will review quickly the impact of deindustrialization, right, on northeastern and midwestern cities. Four, we'll talk a bit about you know, and that comes from the Segrew piece and the fourth piece, which refers to um, Robert Self's selection that you read. We'll talk a bit about the spatial dynamics and implications of post-war suburban-urban divides, right? And that the concentration is on Oakland and southern Almeida County, right? And then last, the fifth thing that we'll do in this lecture is we'll raise some questions and some implications of this history. And that's where the Wakant piece that you read um, from slavery to mass incarceration comes in. And it's also where the John McWhorter piece that you read comes into play. You know, there was some comments before class about how McWhorter is a very, a very strong, clear critic, right, of a lot of what you read, right? And uh, I think that, you know, pedagogically it's important that we read multiple um, approaches to these questions, right? We can't just read one particular argument from one particular point of view. Um, so that's why I gave you the McWhorter piece from his book, uh, Winning the Race, right? Which is a criticism of much of the other things that you read, right? So the post-war urban crisis, I'll start there. Um, what was it, right? What was the urban crisis or what is this historical phenomenon that I'm referring to as the urban crisis. And on the one hand, it is political and cultural reactions to mid to late 1960s violence and disorder in American cities. Right? It's also a shorthand explanation for the fiscal insecurity. Right? A lot of cities, a lot of northeastern and midwestern cities are experiencing fiscal crisis in the mid-1960s. 
which is basically they can't, they can't pay their bills. Right? They cannot pay their bills. Um, the urban crisis refers to the fiscal insecurity that's besetting many northeastern and midwestern cities. It, it refers to the decline in services right, that rack many northeastern and midwestern cities, decline in police protection, fire, transportation, sanitation, right, which is related to the inability of cities to pay their bills. Right? So, and it also refers to um, the loss of a tax base, right, the loss of tax revenue. Right? So the, fis uh, the urban crisis is a way to talk about these political and cultural phenomena. Right? The violence and disorder, which I'll talk more about in detail, as well as the fiscal insecurity that's really hitting American cities in the Northeast and Midwest particularly hard. So, you know, in the urban crisis, right, as a concept, it's an overarching way to think about a confluence of social issues. Crime, um, disinvestment, abandonment, right, the abandonment of housing, uh, depopulation. What will the role of government be in American cities? The role of government in policing, in sanitation, in education. Right? How will government in cities deal with housing issues in the, mid to, in the late 20th century? How will it deal with loss of employment? Right? And how will it deal with this kind of all-encompassing concept of race relations? Right? I'm still not totally sure about what people mean by race relations. <laughs> um, but I think that in the mid 20th century, right, and beyond, right, race relations was this way to talk about racism, right, to talk about the effects of racism, and to talk about how in cities, right, primarily how African American and black populations would fare as citizens, right. Black populations are particularly important, right, when we're talking about post war American cities, and we'll see why uh, later on in the lecture, right, because their numbers swell so much, right, in the mid-20th century, because there are so many structures, right, if we could go back to our study of C. Wright Mills and the sociological imagination, and I'll revisit that a bit, right, there are so many structures that shape uh, black people's lives in cities in particular ways, right, and these create again, what Mills would refer to as social issues, right? These create social issues and crises, right? There's a crisis of segregation in housing. There is a crisis of poverty and unemployment, right? Some would argue there are crises in crime, right? In cities, right? So it's important that we focus on uh, black populations when we're talking about the urban crisis for those structural issues. What caused the urban crisis? Right. There are, I think, four, four main things that I'm going to hit on, and kind of a half one that I'll throw out, out there right now. You know, one of the things that people say caused the urban crisis is black migration, right? I mean, that's one of the arguments at the time. That's one of the arguments, that's kind of one of the myths and the stories that people who lived in cities, who were immigrants, who grew up in communities that they see transformed, that's kind of one of the stories and arguments that they make. What happened to American cities? Why did they suffer all of these calamities? Well, it's because right at the time in the mid 20th century when African Americans moved from the South in such large numbers, the city begins to decline. The, res the, the reason for the decline must have something to do with these newcomers, right? It must have something to do with who they are, right? The culture that they bring, right? This culture of poverty that people start to talk about, right? Their behavioral practices. These are arguments and ideas that float around as to why cities change the way they do. It's not for a structural issue. It's not for a political issue, right? It's a cultural issue, right? It's a behavioral issue. It's the way that, quote unquote, those people are. Right. Now, I think, I think much of the rest of the lecture will engage in that argument right, in some way, shape, or form. So I'll just let it hang there for a bit. I'm not going to tell you if it's right or if it's wrong, right? but I'm going to go through some of the other causes of the urban crisis that people at the time and scholars since right, have 
pieced together, right, to understand the long history of it, right, and the structural reasons for it as a social issue. Going back to Mills, though, a bit, right, if we argue that these problems, these problems of abandonment, loss of tax base, loss of jobs, right, residential segregation, if we argue that those are the fault of the people who came, then we're treating it as what, right? Mills would say that that's treating it as an individual trouble, right? That this is the result of these individuals and their individual troubles. Therefore, the solution is if you just fix them, right? If you fix the way that they act, the way that they think, right? Then you will fix the urban crisis. I, okay, my personal and my, you know, my personal opinion and my opinion as a historian is that that doesn't make much sense, right? Personal behavior could not cause the problems that we see with the urban crisis. That, it's not the result of what some people do, right? We have to look at it structurally. We have to ask those three questions that Mills invited us to ask, right? What's the structure of the society? What's the history of the society? And who prevails and who doesn't? Right? Who wins and who loses? Who has power? Right? So that's kind of a half, a half answer to the question, well, what caused the urban crisis? I mean, and I say that in the beginning, and I say it because I want you to think about it, right? I want you to think about those arguments. Right? I want you to think serious, take them seriously. Right? Okay, so one thing that caused the, racial, um, the urban crisis, and this comes straight out of the government report that followed the 1960s um, violence, right, is that racial discrimination caused the ur urban crisis. That's straight out of the um, Kerner Commission report, right, or the report of the National Advisory Commission on Civil Disorders, published in 1968. Racial discrimination caused these problems, particularly the problems that led to the violence that erupts in cities in the mid-1960s. You know, if I could... Um, just briefly give you some insight into that, right? Starting in around 1964, but really the nation takes attention in 1965, there are these moments of urban disorder, right? Or at the time, people referred to them as race riots, right? Others of different political position called them urban rebellions or uprisings. Some of you who took racial and ethnic conflict in the American city, this will be familiar, right? In the mid-1960s, there's these moments, these kind of punctuated moments of violence in cities, right? And it's pretty, some of them, some of them are pretty catastrophic, right? The first one, which doesn't get a lot of attention, happens in New York, right? It's 1964, it's the summer of 1964. A white police officer off-duty shoots and kills a African-American teenage young man in Manhattan. Harlem and Bedford-Stuyvesant People come together in rally against this act of what they see as an act of aggression, this act of police br brutality, and violence kind of spurs right from those collective gatherings. In the end, one person dies, 500 are injured, 465 are arrested, and there's up to a million dollars in property damage in New York. Again, that's 1964. Not many histories of the mid-60s disorders really takes that New York moment into account. People really start to wake up and pay attention to the possibilities of urban violence in black sections of cities in 1965 with Los Angeles, right? Which Hirsch, you know, he made some reference to it a bit. August 11th, 1965, violence spreads throughout the Watts section of Los Angeles for six days. Again, in response to an altercation between an African-American citizen and a police officer. Six days of violence that results in 34 dead people, 1,032 injured, 3,400 arrested, the National Guard is called in, and over 970 buildings are damaged or destroyed, estimated at $40 million in property loss. That's Los Angeles, 1965. 1967 is a long, hot summer in the language of the 1960s insofar as there are multiple moments of violence in cities throughout the country, the two largest concentrating in Detroit and Newark. Again, both tied to 
altercations, misunderstandings, moments of violent exchange between African Americans and police officers. July 12th through 17th, 1967, Newark erupts into disorder. That results in 26 people dead, 725 injured, 1,500 arrested, and property damages estimated at over $10 million. Detroit, after a police raid of an after hours, illegal after hours establishment, Detroit erupts into violence for four days in July of 1967. 43 dead, 33 black, 10 white, 467 injured, 7,200 arrested, half of whom had no prior arrest record, it was indicated. 2,500 stores looted, 388 families left homeless, 412 buildings damaged and demolished, and between 40 and 80 million dollars in property damage in the Detroit violence. So, <laughs> this is the <a> crisis. <laughs> right? I think Mills would agree, or Mills would kind of, this would be something that he would point to, a disruption in collective values that leads to a moment of crisis. Right? So, when the federal government brings a panel together to investigate these moments of, these moments of disorder, right? these moments of violence, they want to ask three main questions. Right? What happened? Why did it happen? And how can we prevent it from happening again? The overarching theme of the Kerner Commission report is that racial discrimination caused this. Right in the introduction, the Commission report states, our nation is moving toward two societies, one black, one white, separate and unequal. And later on in the introduction to the report, the Commission surmises that what white Americans have never fully understood, but what the Negro can never forget, is that white society is deeply implicated in the ghetto. White institutions created it, white institutions maintained it, and white society condoned it, end quote. Right? So that's a quote from the Kerner Commission report. So much focus regarding the causes of the urban crisis was on the violence in black sections of cities. Right? People were extremely, you know, this, for a lot of people in America, this came out of nowhere. Where did this happen? Especially given that it's the mid-1960s, right? This would be a time normally when I'd ask you a question. Is that, can I do that? Can I, you know, anybody might feel bold enough to step up to the mic? You, you know the answer, we could do this, let's, you know. <laughs> What's happening in the mid-1960s, right, in the United States that might cause people in the country to look at this violence in American cities emanating from black sections with befuddlement and curiosity? It's like, where did this come from? What's going on in the country at that time, right, that directly involves African Americans, right, that directly involves their, man, now I'm giving it away, <laughs> that would cause people to say, what are all these people in L.A. angry about? Come on, that's messed up. Nobody's gonna, nobody's gonna answer this? No, you gotta come to the microphone, man. Come on, for that now. There you go. The Civil Rights Movement. The Civil Rights Movement, very good. <laughs> The Civil Rights Movement has happened. It is happening, right? Civil Rights Act of 1964 passes, outlaws racial discrimination in public accommodations, has the Section 7 on employment, uh, anti-discrimination in employment, major piece of legislation that redefines American citizenship. First time this has happened since the post-Civil War Reconstruction. Summer of 1965, right before L.A erupts, the United States passes the Voting Rights Act, right? Bringing into kind of fruition the promises enshrined in the 15th Amendment after the Civil War. And there's all this, there's this disorder amongst African Americans in cities and people around the country see this as coming out of nowhere, right? I should say African Americans or 
activists who had been in the cities for decades, they knew that these types of things potentially could happen. They had been talking about it for decades. Right? But the rest of the country wasn't used to thinking about racial discrimination in cities outside of the South. The rest of the country didn't know in some ways or didn't want to know what racial discrimination looked like if there was no Jim Crow sign hanging right, on the water fountain or on the bathroom. Right? How can there be racism in places that have anti-discrimination laws? How can you have racism in a place like Chicago where African Americans can vote? Right? Racism is a southern phenomenon, Americans believe. Right? So this violence that erupts in the mid-1960s seems like it comes out of nowhere. So that's kind of one reason to point to what caused the urban crisis. Another is this phenomenon of suburbanization. Right, which we'll talk about a bit. Right? So it's the loss of the urban tax base, and particularly it's the loss of the urban tax base at the precise moment when city services, especially for poor citizens, are most strained. Right? It's the time, you know, the loss, the erosion of the tax base, the loss of tax dollars at a moment when cities have to deal with housing issues. Right? Increased housing issues for poor and unemployed residents. When the cities are coming in contact with the need to deal with youth issues, youth programs, youth unemployment. Right? When increased population in cities is putting strains on infrastructure such as public schools. Right? When increased crime is putting even more strain on police departments when abandonment and arson is putting strain on fire departments at the precise moment that cities need tax dollars the most to fund services is the moment when they are losing those tax dollars, right? primarily due to suburbanization, right? primarily due in, and to unemployment and deindustrialization. But one reason is suburbanization, right? the loss of the tax base, right? which sometimes people refer to as uh, white flight. Right? You may have heard that term, white flight. And, you know, it's true, right? Cities are hemorrhaging white folk for a few reasons, right? Um, which we'll get to. We'll get to in a bit. Um, but, you know, the white flight argument can take on a few connotations that don't really help to explain what happened in cities or really doesn't help to explain what caused white flight, right? If you just say, well, you know, why are cities going down the tubes in the mid-1960s, well, white flight, right? White people are leaving. Again, there's this kind of individualistic trouble way to think about it is to say, well, you know, white people are leaving and that's what's causing the cities to go down. If white people had stayed, then the cities wouldn't be suffering these social calamities. Right. Uh, and I think, you know, again, when you take structure into consideration, when you ask questions about the structures that, are, that have a history of causing problems in the cities, the simple fact of white people leaving doesn't explain the, what caused the, the crisis. Right? Also, just by saying, well, you know, white people left the cities, it leaves it as an individual choice. Right? When, again, based on what you read, there were structures put in place. Right? Suburbanization was a process facilitated by government, right? underwritten by housing interests, funded by banks. Right? And suburbanization was a process of spatial segmentation and racial segregation in which the, all of these structures were involved. Right? All these structures were involved. So it's not just simply a matter of, well, you know, white people were leaving, and that's what caused these problems. And Heather Thompson, a historian, she makes this really interesting argument about Detroit, where she says, you know, white flight doesn't really kind of begin to end until the 1970s. Right? And these are, you know, cities are erupting in the mid-1960s. And she argues that it's the mid-1970s. If you really look at Detroit, white flight reaches its climax in the mid-1970s and beyond. And she makes the argument that it's because it's at that moment that white people in Detroit, who had controlled the politics, right, who had been the major stakeholders, it's at that mid-1970s point that Heather Thompson argues that whites in Detroit realize we can't control this city anymore, right? It's a black, you know, black voters are going to control the city, 
Right? So since we no longer are major stakeholders in the city and we can, we leave. Right? So the white flight argument, again, it reveals some important phenomenon and it hides some important phenomenon. But it's the second kind of reason that people point to for what caused the urban crisis. The, the last two that I'll speak to, I'll speak to briefly. Right? The third argument that people make for the cause of the urban crisis is liberals right? and liberal spending. Right? Not the type of liberalism... Well, McWhorter kind of, you know, he points to this in the chapter that you read from Winning the Race, right? That liberals are largely responsible for the terrible situation that black people in cities find themselves in. And he, you know, McWhorter makes the case, or he, he tries to make the case that this is about welfare, right? That because liberals kind of put it in black people's heads or put forward a welfare rights movement, that that's what kept African Americans kind of clamped down right, into this inescapable rut, right, in cities. That's not the type of liberalism that I'm, that I'm talking about, right? Liberal spending primarily on the power of democratic municipalities, democratic controlled municipalities, right, in which there's heavily influenced, heavily influenced by unions, municipal unions. They have really strong social safety net programs, Right? A lot of these New Deal programs right, to deal with questions of poverty, housing, education, social service, health and welfare, right? all these things that come about in cities in the, first thir or the second third of the 20th century, one argument for the cause of cities' decline is that they were spending too much. Right? They were spending too much money. Right? They were just spending too much money. It's too much money on social programs, but also too much money on labor, right? In short, city workers in northeastern and midwestern cities, they lived too good, right? They had it too good. Their pensions were too high, their salaries were too high, right? Their productivity was not competitive with a free market, right? So the argument that what caused the urban crisis was liberal spending, right, is also something con to consider, right? Cities outspent themselves. And unions had such a strong, powerful grip on city politics. This is what some people would argue, right? That there was no escaping this problem, right? You can't get away from the liberal spending because unions are too powerful. They'll go on strike like they did in New York City, right? There's a transit strike in 1967. There's a sanitation strike. There's a tra transit strike in 1966. Sanitation strike, 1967. Teacher strike, 1967-1968. I mean, these are three major areas of municipal life that bring the city to its knees in some ways, right? So the liberal spending argument is that cities decline because unions, municipal unions are too powerful and cities spend too much. And there's no way to get out of that. And then the last argument about the cause of the urban crisis is black militants. Like cra crazy black people did this. Right? That's the you know black outsiders, right? Black agitators. Stokely Carmichael, right? from an office in D.C., Stokely Carmichael stretched his tentacles out <laughs> to everywhere and caused black people to uh, rise up in rebellion, right? H. Rat Brown, his famous quote: "The revolution will be in the streets," right? Um, disaffected malcontents, outside agitators, they were the people that fomented this violence. Now the interviews, you know, sociologists and political scientists at the time did interviews with people who were involved in or participated in uh, these social disorders. You could look at the work of a, a scholar named Joe Fagan from the 1960s. And, you know, a lot of those interviews and even the commission, the current commission report itself, don't put much stock in the influence of, of, of agitators, right, of black militants. They're not, that's not who people said influenced them to do what they did. But I think that that argument is important, right? It's important to think about because it shows the divided way that people thought about this violence and the divided way that people thought about the issues, the social issues that were at the center of it. To use a shorthand term, right, um, African Americans in cities or, you know, people of particular leftist political ideas, right, or radicals or activists, they said that these disorders were caused by discrimination and police brutality, really. 
right? In all of the instances that I gave you as examples, all of them involved an altercation with police officers, right? So there, there's something going on about the relationship between urban black people and police officers that is at the center of this issue, right? That's one way that people interpreted the, the violence, right? And then another way was it has nothing to do with that. It has to do with agitators, right? Militants, right? This shows, again, I think a divided way, right, that people are understanding the problem. Now, let me keep in mind, right, let me just say, cities do suffer, right, from the 1960s through the 1990s. They suffer. They suffer population loss, right? And you have a document with the Segru piece that shows comparisons between populations in the major American cities, the top 25 American cities, at different moments in the 20th century. When you have a moment, look at that. Right? Look at which cities experience population decline and look at which cities experience population increase. Right? That's not just because tens of thousands, if not hundreds of thousands of Americans wanted to go live in Arizona right? or live in what becomes the Sun Belt, work on their tans. Right? The population transference from northeastern and midwestern cities to the emerging Sun Belt right? and California Right? Is, a is a phenomenon of pop uh, that, ex that cities experience in the latter third of the 20th century. Right? And it has structural reasons behind it right, that you read about. Cities suffer. They experience population loss. They do experience erosion of the tax base. That's not a myth. That's, not, you know, that's a very real structural issue. They do experience tremendous poverty, right, or increased poverty. They do experience job loss, as you read in Detroit. They do experience decline in services. I mean, you know, look at some pictures of New York City's subway in the 1970s and the 1980s, right? Like, it's not pretty, right? Graffiti, delayed services, trash, right? All of those are reflections of decline in services. Cities experience these. There is experience in decline in housing stock. And there is, you know, there is problems with crime, drugs, and violence. I mean, those things are real. So cities do suffer, right? Cities do suffer. I would like, you know, keep in mind, though, too, that there are always local people in these cities, right? Residents, activists, housing advocates, teachers, right? Union organizers. There are always people in cities throughout the 20th century trying to fight against these issues, right? There's always people who are doing that, even though we don't usually think about them, right? We don't usually study them. They are there, right? They are there. So I want you to keep that in mind, too. But as you saw, right, in the article about the Bay Area, you saw in the article about the Oakland um, Corridor, right? fighting against these issues is extremely difficult. It was extremely difficult, right? The forces of history that urban activists had to fight against were entrenched. Right? They're entrenched in structures of inequality, spatial structures between where people live. Right? They're entrenched in structures of income divides right? between who has access to jobs and who comes at kind of the moments of deindustrialization. There's stru historical structures of political divisions right? and party. Who can have influence over politics and who can't, right? Why does Proposition 14 pass in 1964, right? Why is the open housing law in California repealed, right? Robert Self shows us that part of the reason that that happened was a structural issue in political influence, right? Those who wanted open housing, African Americans, Mexican Americans, unions, right? Those who advocate civil rights activists, those who advocated for open housing in California in the mid-60s, right, they didn't have the political power. They didn't have the clout. Right? The real estate corporations, the lenders, the banks, the home owners associations, they did. Right? And they had amassed it over decades. So there's historical structures of inequality that make it very difficult to fight against these things. There's institutions, right? Banking institutions, real estate institutions, political institutions, homeowners institutions that make it very difficult to fight against these problems, right? And there's rhetoric, 
right? There's the rhetoric of equality that Robert Self wrote about. What racism? We're not racist. So what that there's no black people who live here and there never have been and we don't want them, but we're not racist. We're homeowners. We just want freedom. We're just individual, we're just individual freedom-loving people. We're not racists. We're not pot-bellied, red-faced southern sheriffs. We're not Bull Connor. Look at us. We're Don Draper, right? We're not racists, right? There's that rhetoric. Now, how do you fight against that? How do you fight against historical structures of inequality? How do you fight against political inequality to influence outcome? How do you fight against a rhetoric of individualism and individual rights? Right? How do you point out that racism exists and it affects structures in societies if people can't see or don't want to see that the racism is there? How do you do that? Right? That's the problem that activists in the North face. So again, we can use C. Wright Mills and the, historical, the sociological imagination right, to understand the urban crisis. We can ask those interrelated three questions about structure, history, and who prevails. I'm going to skip this section. You know, just keep in mind that crisis is nothing new in cities, right? It's not like cities existed in human history up until the mid-19th, mid-20th century, and then all of a sudden there are crises, right? In some ways, the function of the city, right, is to deal with crisis, right? I mean, cities since ancient time bring human populations together to deal with commerce and preservation, right? How can we trade easier and how can we come together around, at first, a water source, right, so more people can stay alive? I mean, that's kind of the function of cities in some ways is to manage crisis. I had a little interesting anecdote that I just wanted to share. In the 19th century, the biggest, one of the biggest crises in New York City had to do with transportation, right? A major mode of transportation had gotten out of control. And there was too many people and there were too many of these vehicles for transportation running around the city, right? It's pre-electricity, it's pre-gasoline combustion engine, so the method of transportation that was causing problems in the city is what? Can we just all say it at once so it gets to the microphone? How were people getting around cities in the 19th century? Okay, let's say it together in unison. One, two, three. Horses. Horses, Horses right? Horses were causing problems in cities in the mid-19th century, in the late 19th century, because there were too many of them. And what do horses do when they walk around Central Park and you're behind them jogging, minding your own business? What do they... No, you don't have to answer. <laughs> Horse manure, right? Horse manure is a major problem in late 19th century in New York City. What are we going to do with all this horse manure? People, doomsday scenarios are saying that horse manure is going to pile 30 stories by the 1930s. There's no way to get rid of this horse manure. The horses are defecating faster than we could get rid of it. What are we going to do? Right? And then boom, right? the invention of electricity solves the problem. Electrical trolley cars replace all the horses. And except for the people who probably owned the stakeholders that had the interests in the horse and carriage taxi system, right, most people probably didn't lose out in this, pro in this, in the solving to this problem. Now, again, that's a technological solution to what was an infrastructure social problem, right? That was a technological solution. Technological solutions aren't going to solve the problems associated with the urban crisis, right? In some ways, Segru points out that technological innovation makes it worse, right? So cities have always had crisis. They've always had all kinds of crisis. The urban, the urban crisis is not necessarily new. Right? But it is something that involves a tremendous amount of social structure right, coming together in a set of issues that's not going to be easily solved by the market or technology. Right? The market and technology didn't create it. Right? So you can't really look to the free market or technology to solve these problems of segregation, unemployment, discrimination, poverty, right, et cetera. You know, John McWhorter makes the case in the book that you read, black people should just move, right? Why are black people in these cities? Why are they they're stuck in these cities? They're not leaving because they're dependent on welfare, right? Or they're kind of addicted to this ideology of welfare, 
Right? That's McWhorter's, one of McWhorter's arguments, right? Why don't they just pick up and move where the jobs are? Well, structurally, you know, there are impediments to just doing that, one of the primary ones being housing. Right? How, do you, you know, how do you just pick up and find housing in other places where there may be jobs? Right? How do you pay first month's rent, last month's rent, deposit? Right? If you're on public assistance or unemployed, like, where do you come up with that? That's a structural impediment to doing what John McWhorter prescribes. Right? So the problems of the urban crisis are not simply going to be solved by market-based solutions right? or technological innovations, right? Because in some ways that's not what caused it. There's three characteristics, three his histories in some ways related that I'll talk about for the remainder of the class, right? There's the history of the so-called second ghetto. And I want you to think about the word ghetto, right? When you use it or don't use it. I like to try to, I try to remind people when I do lectures that, you know, people People don't live in ghettos, right? People live in communities. Right? Now, there's a difference when you say that, right? There's kind of a, 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 there's a cognitive difference, right? People don't necessarily live in ghettos. People live in communities, right? Communities and cities. You could say, you know, people live in racially segregated communities, right? But this language of ghettos and ghettoization, I usually like to, so much of what we read uses the language of the, the ghetto. Right? But ghettoization, I would encourage you to think, think of it as a process, right? not necessarily a place. Right? Although there are spatial characteristics to racial segregation, poverty, joblessness, political disempowerment, right? there is a spatial connotation to that, and that's very important. The spatial dynamic is important. Right? The white noose around... Right? the black neck, right? That real vivid kind of visceral image that Robert Self uses from a 1960s document to the, for the title of that chapter. But, you know, again, I, I we will use the language of ghetto, right, analytically, right? We'll use it kind of sociologically, but that's not licensed to kind of throw it around, right? Like as if it, you know, you, you, you cross into a particular neighbor, like you cross into the south side of Chicago and like there's a sign that says like, welcome to the ghetto. <laughs> like <that's>, no. <laughs> you know, you cross 96th Street in New York, you know, welcome to the hood. It's not, you know, it's not like that, right? Ghettos, ghettoization and ghettos are processes, right? They're not, you know, people don't, I would argue, people don't live in ghettos, people live in communities. Communities that are shaped by histories of ghettoization, right? We're going to talk about what Hirsch calls the second ghetto, right? Um, I want to show you some maps, right? And again, the racial discrimination that shaped these communities, right? The ghettoization process that shaped urban communities in American cities in the mid, in the 20th century, right? They had spatial components, right? Which you can see when you use census maps, right? This is a wonderful, um, uh, database called Social Explorer, you will be, become very familiar with it because you have an entire assignment that you have to do based on it. I know that you all already became familiar with it because you looked up the populations uh, in your own census tract, right? Let's just say yes collectively. Yeah, that's okay. I did my homework. I sent it to you. Um, Social Explorer is a fantastic tool that you'll become very familiar with. But let me show you some maps that I created if it lets me. Oh, did I? Oh, I didn't sign in. See that? Where are my glasses? They're on my face. I have a terribly long password. I want to show you kind of some spatial images of what the process of ghettoization looks like. Um, let's do the one that, that, that they prepared. I like this one. No, you know, we'll come back to that one. Let's do the ones I prepared. Um, let's look at Detroit. Let's look at um, so-called Black Detroit from 1940 to 1990. And I'm just going to let it play a few times. So this is 1940. 
right? The shaded in sections represent the concentration of black people in Detroit in 1940. And I'm, I'm going to play the maps as they go through to 1990, play them a few times. And again, you can see the spatial dynamic of segregation, what it, you know, what it looks like. Right, and get to the end. I'll let it play one more time. Now let's look at white Detroit. And you can imagine, again, what the, the map will look like, right? That small kind of enclave, that community that's centered right in the middle of the screen in, in 1940, right, which had been a black population since 1900. Right? That is going, the, the, the whiteness in there is going to expand, right, when we look at the, the inverse. So again. Let's look at, we study, uh, let's look at Chicago, black Chicago. I'll let it play one more time. Okay, and again, you can imagine the inverse is true for white Chicago. And let me do uh, let me do two more. Let me do Oakland, the Oakland, the Oakland uh, Milpitas Belt that you read about in the Robert Self article. Here is kind of the black population in that Bay Area from 1940 to 1990. And again, the reason I picked these years, right, because these are the years 1940 to 1960 is the years that Hirsch points to as the emergence of the of the, so the second ghetto, right. And I'll, we'll talk, you know, quickly about what that means. All right, so that as African American populations are concentrated in and around Oakland, right, that's kind of where they grow. One of the interesting things about this map, I didn't create it, but there, there's less pronounced kind of color difference in the map because of large... Uh, Spanish-speaking populations that are moving to this area, uh, which you read a bit about. Um, but let's just look, we'll do two more. We'll look at, um, well, I'll look at, at uh, white, white Oakland. You're kind of getting a sense of the pattern as to what this looks like. Right, over time, again, and Robert Self makes this really, really clear, right? Whites are controlling the housing markets around the city, right? They are regulating the housing markets around the city. They are controlling African Americans from not being able to move in, right? And then, you know, since we are going to spend quite a bit of time on uh, the wire and on Baltimore, I did, um, I did Baltimore. I thought I did. Did I? I didn't. I didn't do Baltimore. Let's do Boston just because, of, you know, why not? So, white Boston. All right, you can really get a sense of how uh, the African American enclaves kind of around the Roxbury corridor become concentrated more and more over time. Um, and that will be apparent when we look at uh, black Boston. Okay. All right, so you get a sense, right, from looking at some of these maps that there's a spatial component uh, to this history, right, to the history of the creation of what Hirsch calls um, the second ghetto, right? African Americans had lived, again, in cities since there were American cities. There had been populations of African Americans in cities in the 
19th century, right? You read a little bit, but not much about how those populations increase in the 1910s through the 1930s with kind of that first wave of great migration, right? Now, earlier historians kind of pointed to that 1890s, 1930s period, right, as the creation of the ghetto, right? The enduring ghetto is what one historian kind of used that language to refer to what happens to those black communities in cities that form in the early 20th century. As you saw from the maps, right, it's kind of those small areas, they kind of become the ground zero, right, for the incredibly large African-American communities that come from the 1940s through the 1960s, right? Hirsch points out that there's a difference between those black communities and the second ghettos that come from them from the 40s through the 60s. Right? One of the major differences between those two communities right, are the processes uh, that created it, that created them. Right? With the early 20th century, like say the 1890s to the 1930s, African Americans were funneled into particular areas of cities like Chicago, Detroit, New York, right? And they couldn't move. And the methods that people used to kind of keep African American workers in those cities were restrictive covenants, community improvement associations, and violence, right? The early 20th century in places like Chicago and Detroit is characterized by violence as a method of preventing black homeowners from moving into white neighborhoods, right? Restrictive covenants, what are they, right? In short, Restrictive covenants are when a group of homeowners get together and agree not to sell their housing to a particular population, right? Primarily in American cities during the early 20th century, the main targeted groups were uh, Jewish people and African Americans, right? Barring those two communities from moving in, right? Through a collective agreement, right? Through a form of regulation, right? That's a restrictive covenant. There's the kind of community improvement association. If you've ever seen or read Raisin in the Sun, right, there's this fantastic example uh, of the community improvement association coming to uh, the African American family who's moving into a, an all white neighborhood. And the community improvement association representative says, we'd like to buy your house back from you because you know, it's always better when you live with your own people, right? I would encourage you to watch the version of the movie with Sidney Poitier. No comments on any of the other ones, right? <laughs> or read the book, right? Or read the play, rather, right? Um, community Improvement Association served as a way for white homeowners to collectively keep out undesirables, right? And then there's just good old-fashioned violence, right? Bombings, shootings, mobs outside of recently bought home, uh, homes recently bought by African Americans. And you could read some of these cases in Chicago and in Detroit uh, from the early 20th century. Um, that's what kind of maintained the so-called, the first ghetto, right? And well, what happens because of this, because of this concentration of African Americans in these restricted areas? There's incredible strain on housing, right? And there's increased tensions that lead to violence. 1917 to 1919, waves of violence spread throughout cities in the United States in places like Chicago, East St. Louis, Illinois, um, Washington, D.C., Tulsa, Oklahoma in 1921, Elaine, Arkansas, right? Waves of violence, literal race riots, right? And Hirsch talks about that a bit in the article that you read, that these, these were pitched battles between blacks and whites, which is very different from the so-called commodity riots of the 60s, right? Where black and white people aren't killing each other because Hirsch shows that that type of social interaction was impossible by the mid-1960s. That the second ghetto was so calcified, right? Was, uh, was so hardened by a different set of structural processes that you didn't have black and white people shooting each other like you did in 1919, the Red Summers in the mid-1960s. You didn't have that. It was socially impossible. Right? So what changes, right? What changes to bring about this second ghetto? The rise of the second ghetto. There's still the use of restrictive covenants. 
right? And you saw that in the article on California. You know, homeowners corporations are still going to effectively use some sort of subterfuge to prevent undesirables from moving in. Even though that's illegal, that's unconstitutional according to a 1948 decision. There's still restrictive covenants. But even more significant, Hirsch points to, is the role of, the, of government. Right? It's the role of the federal government. Right? And he particularly points to some New Deal institutions. Right? Hirsch points out the Homeowners Loan Corporation, the Federal Housing Authority, and the Veterans Administration as three key government institutions that play a role in the intense spatial segregation of African Americans from the 40s through the 60s. Now, how does it work? Let's well, you know, we should even ask the question, why? Like, why wouldn't you want to live next to a black person that could buy a home in your neighborhood? Like, why wouldn't you want to? Like, why would this cause all of this calamity and this problem? Obviously, if they can afford the home, right, they're making similar income as you. Right? I mean, they're not just, it's not just like, oh, let's give the house away to any black person because we want black neighbors. I mean, black people who tried to move into Ossian Suite, right, is the 1920s Detroit family. <laughs> you know, he's a doctor. Uh, he has a fam you know, he's, he is a middle class, hardworking citizen. When he tries to buy a home in a white section of Detroit, they try to kill him. Right? Mobs surround the house. His brother, a family member of his, shoots somebody. That person goes to jail. Right? Dr. Sweet, you know, he's involved in all of this stress. He eventually moves out of the neighborhood and kind of dies from the stress. Right? Why wouldn't you want Dr. Sweet as your neighbor? Right? There's a lot of reasons for it. One is you have all of these conceptions about who black people are and who they aren't. Right? But two, there are structural reasons that make it so that when black people move into white neighborhoods, when neighborhoods turn, right, that in the eyes of lending institutions, real estate institutions, brokers, banks, that this is a sign that a neighborhood is in decline, right, that this is a sign that a neighborhood's property values are going to go down, right. So in, in its essence, right, white people don't want to live next to black people because some of them are racist, right, and some of them have extremely visceral fears about the loss of their property value. What does this look like? Well, with something like the HOLC, right? This is a document from a book by uh, Craig Stephen Wilder, a historian at MIT who wrote a book about Brooklyn, New York, um, and showed the ways that racial ideology played a role in Brooklyn's social history. Wilder provided us with this HOLC map, right? Now, if you can notice, can't see it too, too good, but right in the center, right around here, right, by the 1930s, this is what becomes the black section of Brooklyn, right? This is kind of what becomes the shorthand term of Bedford-Stuyvesant, right? And its HOLC grade is a D. A lot of these areas in northern central Brooklyn, which have D grades, right, are areas where there are already African American populations. So when the Homeowners Loan Corporation, right, a government underwriting agency, which makes it possible for people who are not homeowners to acquire loans to get homes, or for people who are homeowners to refinance and improve their homes, right, these, this government program, right, downgrades predominantly black areas and prevents them from being viable investments. Right? Prevents them from being viable investments. See, send like Ku Klux Klan members into Bedford Stuyvesant with pitchforks and burning crosses. No, right? It's 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 not that type of racism. It's not your it's not your granddaddy's racism, right? Like this is the new and improved racism, right? Or rather, this is a structural, right? Policy driven mechanism that creates spatial segregation and disinvestment and decline, right? And it reinforces the ideas that people have about black neighbors. Because when black homeowners in North Central Brooklyn can't get loans to refinance their home, when they themselves can't get underwritten loans to move to other areas, what happens to this neighborhood over time? It becomes crowded, 
the housing stock declines, the neighborhood becomes underserviced, it becomes dirty, and it is blacker and blacker and blacker. Right? The, the census tracks in North Central Brooklyn by 1960, 98, 99, 100% black. So in people's minds, well, what created these social problems, right? The people, the people, right? Not the policy. Because how many people read like HOLC maps? <laughs> Not many, right? The Federal Housing Authority and the Veterans Administration, right? Underwriting loans to vets to move where, right? To suburbs, right? To these burgeoning, newly developed, suburban tract housing units on the outskirts of cities, right, that are facilitated uh, by house, uh, highway construction, light rail construction, etc. But a lot of those suburbs, the Levitt towns of America, are racially exclusive, right, by design. So, you know, when the FHA is giving loans out and the VA is giving loans out to citizens to provide them with the means to purchase their homes in the 1930s and 40s, Right? They themselves don't have clauses against African Americans using the loans, but a lot of those loans and a lot of those housing development projects are in places where black people can't move. Right? So there's a structural impediment right, to African American mobility right? that Hirsch argues is the cause of the second ghetto. He's, he's, this is what makes this ghetto different right, in the article that you read by Hirsch. Right. There's also you know, a phenomenon called blockbusting, right? in which predatory lenders, to use a 21st century example, or kind of real estate agents infiltrate neighborhoods and disseminate fear about blacks moving in so that whites will sell low, so then the agents can then do what? Help me out here. Just say it out loud. Turn around and sell the house higher. Right? Turn around and sell the house higher. All right, so that's kind of the ways that segregation worsens, worsens over time. And then there was another argument that Hirsch made about public housing, right? And I want to just briefly show you one clip from a really a, 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 a new documentary. You know, Hirsch makes the argument that public housing and the explosion of public housing in primarily African-American enclaves, but not solely, Right? But public housing that responds to the needs of people in cities, right? So activists, uh, black activists in Chicago, Detroit, New York, they want public housing. They need public housing, right? They get public housing, but they get it along racially segregated, disinvested lines, right? And they get it again at this moment when so many of them are moving and so many of them need housing and so few of them are finding jobs. So what started out as a welcomed change in policy turns into right, a nightmarish situation, right, which literally in the late 20th century, people just destroy. Right? They just bulldoze these things down to the ground. This is, this is a really good um, documentary about a public housing uh, complex in St. Louis that kind of shows you some of this phenomenon. So I'm just going to play this. These developments are run by the St. Louis Housing Authority. This is a far cry from the crowded, collapsing tenements that many of these people have known. Here in bright new buildings with spacious grounds, they can live. It was a very beautiful place, like a big a hotel resort, I'd say. It was like uh, an oasis in the desert. All this newness. I never thought I would live in that kind of a surrounding. What happened? Well, one day we woke up and it was all gone pulled up with the moving van. I knew at that point that it was hell on earth. Pruitt Highville looks like a battleground. Vandalism and neglect have left fear among the remaining occupants. In the middle 50s, St. Louis thought it had solved its low-cost housing needs, but instead a monster was created. The experiment had gone terribly awry. It was just uncontrollable. is such a symbol that we tend to forget that it is no different than the city that surrounded it. What happened to St. Louis was tragic, but that's simply not how we told the story. 
crew at IGO was always fighting against this terrible riptide of destruction in the midst of an economy that was dying. The strong, tightly knit communities and families in which I grew up had begun to shatter, and it wasn't there. And it was one of the most tragic things I've, I've seen. It seemed to me that we were being penalized for being poor. That caused so much anger. Persons that don't have a decent place to stay are willing to take these kinds of chances. Where we live, we're taking chances. This is it. This is out of control and we are no longer going to feel it. We're not going to tolerate this anymore. I just learned of it. So what I love about it too is not only does it show kind of the hope and the optimism and then the transference to kind of decline and abandonment, but it all, again, you see people, right? You see organizers, tenants, activists, right? Who are at the center of what's happening in their lives. And that's something, again, that I think is really missing in some ways from the, his, the narratives that we tell ourselves about the urban crisis. But moving on in kind of the five minutes that I have remaining. One of the arguments that William Julius Wilson is going to make in the book that we read, When Work Disappears. You have 15 minutes. Really? Yeah. yeah. I, I always do that. Thank you. You are such, you are such honest students. <laughs> you know, one of the um, things that Wilson argues in When Work Disappears, right, is that it's extremely... Everybody now glared at that one. No, that's not true. <laughs> you know, is that one of the things that undergirds what Wilson will call social organization, right? We'll read about that. One of the things that makes communities viable and stable is, is employment, right? Or rather, he raises the question that we have to ask, we have to look at the jobs economy, right, to understand what's happening in this social situation. Again, put your sociological imaginative hats on. Right? What are the structures? What is the history? Who prevails and who doesn't? Right? People, when we talk about the urban crisis, I didn't mention this, we'll talk about this a lot later on in the semester, one of the things that people point to is the dissolution of families, the dissolution of black families right, in particular. Big, big part of the discourses about crisis in, 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 in black communities in America from the 60s to the present, right? And then you saw in the clip of the trailer, there was that kind of hinting at, you know, we, we, it seemed like we were punished for being poor. We used to have intact communities and all of that went away. There's a lot of reasons for that. And, you know, social science, people like to hone in on one thing, right? People like to hone in on one thing. The reason that families decline is because of some sort of pathology, right? That's coming from a report that we'll talk about later in the semester, shorthand is the Moynihan Report, right? But the Negro family in American history, right? That there's pathological practices in black families, right? The, the, um, um, there's a cult of matriarchy, all these issues that people p try, try to isolate and point to, right? And a lot of people mis misinterpret Moynihan in some ways, but that idea runs wild, right? That the reason black families decline is because <laughs> black people don't get married or they have, there's these pathological reasons. Tangle of pathology, that's the language that Moynihan used. Okay, you know, it's important to think about that, but one of the arguments that Wilson makes, one of the arguments that Segru shows, is that there is a structural issue that's tied to employment. Right? Again, that right at the time when African Americans are moving to cities by the hundreds of thousands from the 40s through the 60s, right, is the very same time from the late 40s, the post-World War II era into the 50s, that the jobs economy radically changes. Radically changes. Now, you know, again, this is not scientific, this is not, I mean, 
it's pretty hard to maintain a stable family without employment, like without, without a job, right? Or without a job that can provide for what? Housing, clothes, food, right? It's very hard to maintain a family with that. So if all of these hundreds of thousands of black people right, are coming to cities at a time when the possibility for them to enter into a industrial manufacturing economy is disappearing, or it's rapidly, rapidly changing, right, then how can they maintain, support, create viable, again, what Wilson calls social organization? How can they support institutions like churches and fraternal organizations, um, et cetera? How can, they, how can they maintain family units? Right? It, it's, it's harder. Right? And again, I think that we have a lot of mythological understandings that you know, there was a time in American history when poor people were able to do that no problem. Like, they didn't have these problems. I don't think that that's true. Right? I don't think that's historically true. I think if you look at impoverished communities at any moment in American history, you will see tremendous strain on family units. Because as much as family units are religious you know, and cultural units and social units, they're also economic units. Right? A family is also an economic unit. You know, come visit me at the end of each month when we do our budget. Like, you know, we're running a small business, very small business. Right? So families are economic units too. The argument that Sagru makes that you read about deindustrialization is, is I think it was pretty uh, easy to get. You know, a quote from him, the destructive forces of industrial capital, like the, the destructive forces of industrial capitalism, right, the economic system, began the process of economic corrosion that made Detroit the epitome of the Rust Belt. Right? This was a structural process. And Segru also argues what? Right? That it wasn't just some sort of Adam Smith invisible hand of the market, that these were choices. Right? These were choices that he argues were rooted in labor relations. Right? A contest of power between employers and primarily unions or workers. That's Segru's argument. And he points to those kind of main issues to illustrate his point. Right? He points to the fluidity of capital, right? or the ability for capital to move. Right? The ability of jobs and investment and factories to move. Right? He points to automation. The section on automation is fascinating. It's fascinatingly complicated, right? That at the time when, again, entry-level workers, not experienced, you know, not people who are experienced on an assembly line, entry-level people, in some instances, coming from rural agricultural backgrounds, the time that they enter American cities and undergo a process of proletarianization, right? That's from William Monroe Trotter's study of black Milwaukee in the early 20th century. Trotter says this whole ghetto stuff, right, doesn't explain what's happening to black people. What's happening to black people is they're becoming industrial workers, right, and he calls it a process of proletarianization, right. So at the moment when, again, tens of thousands of African Americans are beginning the process of proletarianization or they're turning into an industrial working class is the moment when those jobs are being replaced by machines, right? And you remember that fantastic line that from Segru's article that you read where the, uh, the, the person says to the union boss, it's going to be really hard to organize all of these machines. Right? It's going to be really hard to create a union with all of these machines that do all the work. Right? So the ability of capital to move, right? And the movement of factories into suburbs, into the south, Automation, Segru also points to uh, uh, the tax policies, the structures of taxation, right, that draw capital and work out of cities and relocate them elsewhere, primarily in the Sun Belt. And he points to the politics, the shifting political power in Congress, right, which is moving military installations and manufacturing installations outside of northeastern and midwestern cities where labor is cheaper and taxes are lower. All of these processes come together right, to make it so these migrants, these southern migrants, white and black, 
right? But primarily, these tens of thousands of African-American migrants who come to cities at this time cannot enter into the job market. And there's a whole lot of repercussions from that that Sir Gru hints at that we'll talk about later. It, you know, it's not just about you not getting a paycheck. Right? It's about also an entire generation of people not being socialized into a system of work, not developing networks and connections through unions right, to be able to navigate other areas of the social sphere in the city, not being able to, again, support their institutions, right? that whole city within a city concept that had been present in the black enclaves of the early 20th century begins to unravel not necessarily because of some pathological impulse, but, you know, things cost money, right? And you can't underwrite those social organizations without income, right? All of these structural forces are occurring at this time. And Sagru outlines, you know, who, who prevails and who doesn't? Who is hit hardest by this? Right? Primarily young black men, right? That's how Sagru concludes the article. It's young black men who suffer the most, right? So the, that, that's the, the kind of second historical process that we look at when we talk about the urban crisis, right? This kind of 1940s through 1990s urban crisis, the deindustrialization argument. And again, McWhorter makes, McWhorter makes some arguments in winning the race about deindustrialization, right? That it's an, you know, it's an overblown argument. Right? that black people could have and should have just thought about moving. Again, I, 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 think if you've, I don't think he's wearing his sociological imaginative hat. Right? I, it's not to say that he's wrong, right? but he's thinking about this as a personal issue. And again, I, I think that he's not looking at all of the different structures that are in place that make it difficult, we'll say. I won't say impossible, make it difficult for people to just pick up and move. Right. Housing and employment being two of the biggest. Segru also tries to reinforce these were not benign market forces. This was not just the invisible hand of the market. or These were choices. People made choices. And the primary choice was to produce industrial material cheaper and with less of a tax burden. When that happens, the city suffers. Because again, with Detroit, it's not just the automobile industry that leaves, right? It's not just the big three that undergo these changes. It's all of the independent automobile manufacturing industries in the city. It's all of the subsidiary support industry, right, that create parts and tires and accessories, etc. It's the institutions and communities, the bars, right, the restaurants, the churches, all of that declines right, when these structural processes go into place. Last, Robert Self takes our gaze to the question of suburbanization, but again, not just suburbanization as this white flight, white, black, white backlash phenomenon. Right? It's suburbanization that and is tied to an impending, what he calls, tax revolt. Right? that the primacy of property, right, protection of property and a racial understanding of how to protect property has a devastating impact on the Oakland corridor that he writes about. Right? Proposition 14 was a movement ostensibly by liberals. Right? He points out how overwhelmingly these counties voted for Johnson in 1964. This is a movement by liberals, right? And it's caught up, right, both in the stigma that people have about black people as neighbors, the rhetoric of rights and individualism, the lies that people tell about fighting deregulation, the rhetoric of not being racist, right, being caught up in this idea that we are not racist, this isn't racism, right, and the structures of inequality that shape this, this area, right, transportation structures that make it difficult, right, if not impossible for people to just find employment in this expanding suburban uh, industrial corridor, right. All of those issues 
self points to as being tied together in what brings about the urban crisis in the sec this section of the Bay Area. Right? One of the biggest aspects of this that I found most fascinating was that the homeowner's loan, um, sorry, the home, um, the home property coalitions that are fighting to remove fair housing are also doing it in the interests of stopping regulation, right? We want to kill open housing because open housing is a form of regulation that prohibits us from selling our property the way we want to as individuals, as property owners, as citizens. Right? That's a regulatory system that is un-American, that is unfair. Meanwhile, that same home association had been practicing its own informal systems of regulation, right? By keeping black residents out through selective uh, selling campaigns, right? So, you know, the self article really points at the complexity, right? Of what brings about the urban crisis. And it kind of hammer hones in a helpful way the ideological connection, right? The rhetorical connection and the ideas that people have regarding who they are and who this nemesis, right, of the black neighbor is. It connects the ideology to the structural, right? So what we see with the articles that we read and what we see with this kind of historical overview of the origins of the urban crisis is that when we take structure seriously, right, we can see the ways that housing, that ideas and that jobs, right, all came together to confine an emerging population of African Americans to areas that are losing jobs and that are in some ways bereft of the type of political power, right, that is necessary to fight these types of institutional issues. Right? And that's what we see really clearly with the self article. Right? So the origins of the urban crisis Right, this crisis of residential segregation, of poverty, of violence, right, is two things I want you to think about. Again, it's structural and it's historical, right? But it, and, and I didn't lecture on this at all, but it's something we have to keep in mind, right, that there are also people, right, who are living in these communities who are dealing with these types of issues, these social issues, as social issues on an everyday basis, right? And that's in some ways, this is the backdrop that creates the world that we will see for the rest of the semester when we watch uh, David Simon's, you know, and the HBO series, The Wire. I'd ask you if you have questions, but we're out of time. So we can do questions on Friday. from now until uh, later.